Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. Um, uh, good evening, uh, everyone, and welcome to the 25th of July meeting of Cabinet. Councillors and officers <clears throat> are reminded to put their mobile phone or, or electronic device on silent if they have one near them, and those present in the room should face forward speaking directly into the microphone and not place papers or electronic devices between themselves and the microphones. Uh, please would uh, remote participants mute microphones when not speaking, as this will reduce feedback and uh, background noise and save bandwidth to prevent loss of connection. Members of the Council joining us remotely should leave cameras on. Officers can leave cameras on only for the agenda item you're speaking on. Um, if any are present remotely, are uh, asked to put cameras on so attendance can be verified if not already on. Uh, I understand that we have Councillor uh, Mia uh, remotely linked up from France. Um, good evening, Andrew. Um, after each item has been presented, I will invite members present in the room to ask questions first. Those members joining us remotely will then be invited to speak, and they should indicate their wish to do so by raising your hand facility. Only those members of Cabinet present in the room will be making the decisions, and I will confirm the result verbally for the benefit of those watching the webcast. Please be aware that there can be a time delay of around five seconds whilst a remote participant appears on screen. Okay, if we can uh, proceed forward, agenda item one, to resolve the minutes of the last meeting, be confirmed as a correct record of the proceedings and signed by me. Do you all agree? Thank you. Um, item agenda two, are there any apologies for absence, Lisa? There are no apologies, Chairman. Thank you. Are there any additional agenda items, Malcolm? There are none, Chairman. And are there any urgent decision items? There are none, Chairman. Okay. Um, disclosure of interests. Uh, members, please speak clearly if you have a personal or personal and prejudicial and say the agenda item it refers to. Councillor Maidley. No, thank you, Chair. Uh, agenda item 11. I'm a director of Bexhill Town Preservation Society. Thank you. Um, Members with a personal and prejudicial, uh, prejudicial interest will be asked to temporarily leave the meeting at the start of the item. Uh, members will be invited to rejoin the meeting when the item is finished. So if we can move on to the first agenda item, which is Agenda 6. Um, this is Article 4, Direction, Coastal Land at Fairlight. Um, ben, um, is Jeff going to introduce this um, and then yourself? Um, because I know I've got Councillor Mia that would like to make a contribution to this particular item? Mostly just Jeff. Okay, Jeff, in. okay. Dedicated to Jeff. Okay, Jeff, nice to see you. Hi there, good to see you too, thank you. Um, I'm going to give, give a brief summary of, of the report. Uh, there's nothing new that, I'm not, that isn't in the report, um, but just to try to help you out, out here and then answer questions. Um, so um, an, it's Article 4. We're talking about Article 4 of the Town and Country Planning General Permitted Development Order 2015. And Article 4 allows a council to take away normally permitted development rights where it is necessary um, and, and, uh, and there is robust evidence to do so. So in this case, we're talking about householder permitted development rights um, in terms of rear extensions, side extensions, roof alterations, additional stories on the roof for... Um, outbuildings. Um, we know there are issues with cliff stability and fair light. In our, in our plan, we already have a, a policy that um, has designated a zone where any applications for planning permission need to submit a, st a, st a structural um, report to demonstrate that it won't have impact. Um, but obviously, at the moment, you can't control permitted development. There's no need for any engagement with the council. Um, so, so we... Um, Instructed independent report from a chartered geologist and civil engineer spe specialising in coastal science, coastal risk management and hillside management. And his, his report is, in, is in, the, um, in the documents and it's summarised in paragraph 6 of the report. I'm just going to summarise that just a little, little bit more. Um, it finds that the most significant factor which results in cliff instability is actually uh, the natural processes, cliff face weathering, sliding, retreating. But it also does come from human activity, uh, loading or surcharge on the cliff as a result of the change in the weight imposed on the top of it, 
Uh, this could cause potentially the top of the cliff to fail and lead to cliff retreat. Um, the report advises that the risk is greatest where the cliffs above Fairlight Cove have yet to reach equilibrium since the, um, the works, to, um, the flood, the um, cliff defences at the bottom were, were installed. And um, there was a, there's an identified great level of, greater level of risk and sensitivity on particular properties uh, right on the edge. And these are the ones Seaward of Sea Road, Cliff Way and Rock Mead Road. And it's there that the advice is that the removal of PD rights is justified. Um, the, the report talks about 12 properties being the most vulnerable, um, but having reviewed that ourselves and in consultation with, with, with Councillor Lemire as well, and um, by talking through uh, with building regulations, what they can control and what they can't control, for instance, they're not involved where it's an outbuilding that isn't for residential use, so you know, a typical incidental building, We've, we've identified 28 properties which we feel should be controlled and, and rights taken away. Uh, and these are shown on map one in appendix two in your report. There's, there's two colours. There's a, there's, um, most of them are covered by a red line, which is list A, where, where it is proposed to remove class A, 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 B, E and F, those being the classes um, covering extensions, additional storeys, roof alterations, outbuildings and hard surfaces. And there's additional list B, which is identified in green, where uh, there are properties that themselves are dwellings are further away from the cliff, um, but they have, um, they have gardens that stretch to the cliff where outbuildings could potentially cause issues. Um, and this, for those properties, it would remove um, just the PD for outbuildings. We're proposing uh, a non-immediate Article 4, so this means that um, if the uh, recommendation is, is agreed, the notices will be published and displayed um, in the area, including notices going directly to the residents affected, with a period of 21 days for the, for the public to make representations, which we need to consider. Um, the, the notice would also say when the Article 4 would come into force. We, we could um, propose an Article 4 that came into effect after 28 days as the most minimum, or up to two years after after the notification. The issue is that compensation is payable um, if we propose a, um, a period of less than 12 months. Um, so what that means is that um, if um, someone put an application in within those 12 months, um, they could claim, um, if that was refused, that they have lost out on um, the potential increase in value from works they could have otherwise done, which imagine they're big properties, big extensions could be quite significant, and also claim for any additional costs that might be imposed on them because of conditions we may impose on, on a planning permission. It's, it's our, it's got, we've got to take a judgment on, on what, the risk, what the risk is. Um, there isn't a lot of guidance our lawyers advise in terms of um, precedence, in terms of what has been claimed in the past in these situations. Um, so I would, I would uh, analyse that as the, the risk is quite small, but the, but the cost could be quite high. So we haven't got a, in my view, we haven't got a contingency to cover that. Um, and therefore, if we're being risk averse, we, sh we should be waiting those 12 months. Looking from the other side, whilst the uh, report does recommend there is an Article 4, um, it's not saying this is a catastrophic situation and this must be, you know, must be in place now or else. Um, and as I already mentioned, it highlights that the natural, um, natural elements are probably more important to cliff erosion. Um, and in addition, the, I think the purpose of the Article 4 is in the long term to take away this PD right and therefore over time cumulative effect prevent uh, and risk, you know, restrict, restrict impacts on, on the cliff. So putting, putting those things together, the right approach seems to be uh, in our, our advice, um, at 12 months, um, that it would come in place in 12 months. And that's the same as the last sort of Article 4 which was imposed, which was to restrict small HMOs in Bexhill Town Centre. Similar situation, you know, we obviously we wanted to restrict them, we wanted to have control over those. Um, could have imposed that straight away if we felt that was absolutely necessary, but that was a 12-month period um, which, to avoid the risk of compensation and that into effect and was, was successful. So that's a, a similar approach. There's a, there's an, you know, there's a process we've used uh, before. So that's, that's my summary. So the recommendation, as I set out in the report, 
is the making of an Article 4 direction in respect of the land that's shown on the, on the map and for those classes of development that, that I've described uh, today. Um, also that the Director of Place and Climate Change be granted delegated authority to confirm the Article 4 direction following the 21-day consultation period um, and subject to any responses I received and considered, of course, so that it comes into effect after 12 months. Um, in addition, as a, as a um, contingency, um, that the Director of Place and Climate Change be granted delegated authority to make an immediate Article 4 direction within that 12-month period if, by uh, notifying of the Article 4, we see um, an uptake in, in uh, residents starting development and therefore it having a, a negative effect by the very purpose we're trying to stop. So there is still that option, um, bearing in mind the compensation risks of bringing in that Article 4 more quickly. Um, it can't be quicker than 28 days from the date we serve the notice, but it could be within that period from then on within the first 12 months. Okay, thank you, Jeff. Um, are there any technical questions that anyone would like to um, ask Jeff before I invite um, others to speak? Council Projects. Could I just ask, um, Jeff, and thank you very much for concluding this work, and I know Council Vinehall would do the same. I know it's taken a long, long time. And if you look at the acknowledgements under the, the, uh, the contents page, you'll see how many people had to be involved in this. Um, but originally when we talked about it, um, is it Dr. Cosman? They had sort of layers of Article 4, like in 10 years, in 20 years, um, so that we could actually look to the future with climate change accelerating, etc. I just wanted to ask, is that idea off the table? I, I know he looked at that in, term, in terms of how you would plan for development in the future and how you would take account of that. Um, and that's in, that's in the report. But, I mean, Article 4 is either it's restricted or it isn't. And we can obviously... He does recommend that we should review that in the future. And, we, you know, and we should be definitely be doing that, you know, reviewing what, what effect it has had. Um, if there are applications, what, you know, what structural reports they, they submit and whether development can take place in, in, a, um, in, a, in a safe way. But, yeah, I think it's about keeping the Article 4 up to date and seeing, monitoring the situation, see what happens. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, if I invite Andrew... Oh, sorry. Yes, I invite um, Ash. Thank you. And um, thank you for the report. Um, the question that I'd like to ask is just the process after the 21-day consultation period. So once we have the representation and responses from the, the consultation... What is the decision-making process from there, please? Thank you. Yeah, well, we're recommending it's delegated to, to, the, to the Director of Place and Climate Change, so I think that would be for, for myself to be writing a report based on what, what, what had been submitted and considering that and making recommendations on whether that's affected in any way um, the recommendation for the Article 4. And, and I'm, I mean, thinking about that, I, I suspect it would be about specific properties and suggestions of whether they should be in or out, though, I think we'd have to consider whether we, we've got that right or, or if we've made a mistake, perhaps, and that needs to be rectified. I imagine they're the sort of issues we would be looking to respond to. OK. Uh, Jonathan, if I invite Andrew, and then you, you can move the report once Andrew has um, uh, made his comments. Uh, Andrew. Uh, thank, thank you, Leader. Um, I very much welcome this report, and I, I thank Jeff Perra for explaining it all so, so very clearly. Uh, he said all the things that I, I would have said. Um, it, it has indeed been a long process. Um, I think I first raised this in about 2014. Um, but we, rather has made major pro progress in protecting our cliffs. There's been a major public investment in the cliff works, and it's well worth uh, protecting this through, through our policies and preventing any, any further slippage, uh, which might happen unnecessarily. Um, we, we've already achieved through the DASA the pulling back of the development boundary from the cliff edge by, by 50 metres. Sokoway is a band in that zone, and planning applications have to be accompanied by proper expert reports. Uh, that's all to the good, but of course it doesn't cover permitted development, and the proposal tonight is to... Uh, uh, is to Ex exclude some of those permitted development rights so that 
uh, a householder wishing to, say, make an extension would have to apply for planning permission in the ordinary way. The intention is not to prevent all development, only to ensure that the proper conditions are observed before uh, a planning application is approved and that it is a safe application. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I, I do concede, I, I agree the point about um, not making an immediate order. It would have been good to see one made immediately. I would say that as the as the ward member, but I, I accept the reasons given by uh, Jeff Pira uh, as to why we can't take the financial risk that, that is involved. Um, and I therefore accept that, and I'm very happy to see the progress that we've made locked in. Um, and uh, I would like to thank, I'd particularly like to thank Councillors Fine Hall and Councillor Proshak, without whom, without their drive and enthusiasm and support, um, we certainly wouldn't have reached this stage now. And I heartily recommend uh, this report to Cabinet for acceptance. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, uh, any comments? Um, Jonathan, please. Uh, yeah, I'll just um, comment before proposing this. This is a belt and braces solution to the problem around Fairlight, uh, and I think it's really worth doing, uh, not the least which because uh, Rother owns a very expensive pumping station very close to the cliff, uh, and uh, and those pumps that that operates, I can't remember how many pumps there are, sort of 20 plus, 20 plus yeah. pumps that are in deep boreholes taking water out of the, uh, the, the back of the cliff, if you like, and in front of the cliff there are these berms which are ro ro rows of... Uh, boulders to stop the uh, erosion from the sea. So I think um, it, it's something which we should do for all of those reasons. Uh, I think it's important to say that uh, an Article 4 for taking away per uh, permitted development doesn't mean that anyone who wants to do something which might have been done under permitted de development won't get that permission. It is highly unlikely that they wouldn't get permission, but it allows us to condition those permissions, which is the important part about you know, what equipment they might use on site uh, or what actions they might take and just uh, ensuring that we protect everything to the level that we can. Uh, as I said, this is, a, this is a belt and braces. I also want to thank um, uh, Andrew for the work that he's put in because mm -hmm. he's put an enormous amount, Andrew Mir has put an enormous amount of work in uh, and Jeff and the policy team because uh, it's additional work and, and it's been quite time consuming. I think one thing that hasn't been mentioned, uh, uh, Councillor Project mentioned, the houses behind the permitted uh, this Article 4 line. And I think the consultant actually suggested that we uh, provide some sort of leaflet for those houses to, whilst they're, they are not, they don't have their permitted development rights taken away, just to explain to them the things that they might think about when, when doing developments to ensure that they don't uh, destabil contribute to destabilisation of the cliff. It's one of these things you really don't know how it's going to happen and when it's going to happen, but Anyone who hasn't been up there, and most pro people probably haven't, and walked along and see, seen the fact that uh, a whole section of cliff is gone, which was a road and houses at one time. And I think uh, once you've seen that, you recognise that uh, it's important to, uh, to do this. So on that basis, I'm very happy to, uh, to propose this. Thank you. Thank you. We have someone to second, second. that. Second. Uh, thank you very much. And though all those in favour, well, that's unanimous. And thank you very much, uh, Andrew, for joining us tonight, uh, and Jeff for the work that's been put in uh, with uh, other members. So um, uh, that's taken care of, and we can move forward to item seven, um, the Revenue Budget and Capital Programme Monitoring Draft 2021-22 out, um, outturn. Um, this is the report of the Chief Finance Officer. Tony? Thank you, Chair, and good evening, everybody. Um, so, yes, yeah, this report is for uh, noting only, and uh, the reason it's drafted, of course, is that it's still subject to audit. Uh, we think that our audit will be completed around about the end of November. That's the, uh, that's the target date at the moment that Grant Thompson had given us. Um, but I would say that we're not expecting many, if any, changes to the numbers that uh, members will see in front of them tonight. So just to pick up on a few of the headlines in, in the report, so the outturn is about 1.3 million lower than the approved budget. So uh, council uh, approved or agreed to, uh, to the planned use of 2.7 million pound drawdown from reserves and we're only using, or we've only used 1.4 million last year. So that's a, that's a good news story. Uh, but there is a, a sort of a, a, a 
a qualification to that comment, if you like, which I'll come to in a second. Uh, the draft capital outturn uh, report uh, figures are about £12.3 million spent, which is well below the budgeted spend uh, and also lower than what we forecast in quarter three. And this links into the point I was just about to make about the uh, drawdown on revenue reserves, is that uh, a large uh, element of the uh, underspend in last year is due to the fact that we didn't have to incur so much in the financing costs for capital expenditure but because of the slowdown in the programme. Uh, now, I will cover this again when I come to do the next report on the quarter one monitoring, but uh, it's not that the projects in the programme have fallen away, it's just the pace of the project. So a lot of this is, uh, is probably going to be down to timing differences. Uh, but I will say, uh, and I think I have said in, in, the, in the quarter one monitoring report, that we will be doing, uh, an, if you like, an affordability review of the, uh, of the, of the capital programme as well as the revenue budget, of course, as part of the medium-term financial planning process. Uh, and I'll say a bit more than that uh, when I get to that report next up, Chair. Uh, so the little bit uh, of information around council tax and business rates, cl uh, collection rates uh, in paragraph 17 and 18, they both improved well on last year, which is a, a promising sign. But again, there's a, a qualification to that, which I'll pick up in the next report. But um, it was good to see that those rates held up through the, uh, through the impact of uh, the pandemic and lockdown. To, um, and they held up to increase rather than over and above 2021 20, levels so that was a that was a good sign as well I, I won't go into the the detail of the report because I'm going to assume that members have read it and uh, picked up on the the bits that they uh, that they wanted to pick up on uh, but again just to say about the capital program it's largely around timing differences that we do have such large variances at the moment uh, so overall, it's a good news story, but with that caveat that uh, we will be spending those, uh, we are still intending to spend uh, um, the, the, uh, the originally planned size of the capital program. We've still got ambitious plans to spend that. But as I say, and I'll come to this and when I do the quarter one report, there is a, an issue around affordability checking on all capital schemes, which we ordinarily do as part of the medium term financial plan anyway. Uh, but I think it's been more brought into sharper focus really as a result uh, of the economic situation nationally and globally, and of course the uh, increase in bank rates. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions if there are any, Chair. Uh, thank you, Tony. Are there any questions for Tony who read this report? Got away with that one, Tony. Uh, no questions? That's sort of report. Okay. <laughs> um, if, if, this, uh, if I can invite uh, Councillor um, Jehoan Ash, is there any comments you'd like to make? Uh, no, thank you. So if we could uh, move the uh, report. Yes, yeah, if I could move the report, please. And someone to second the report. Thank you, thank you Kevin. Uh, are those in favour? Unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, move on to item eight. Tony. Thank you again, Chair. So the, the quarter one outturn forecast, at the moment we're, we're forecasting a, an underspend of £347,000. So uh, again, a plan reduce of reserves of £3.2 million. Uh, we're looking to be about 347000 underneath that. Uh, forecast capital outturn again is well below the, the £111 million budget. But I would say that um, the, the, the report that you see in front of you with regards to capital reports on in year only and what I want to do in, in future reports and we'll bring this to for two members is to sort of make those reports a little bit smarter if you like and report on a project by project uh, report on a project basis if you like rather than just an in financial year because what you see in front of you is just just to spend against this year's budget which is fine and that's how we've, we've always reported it but I think what would be helpful for members as they, they projects ordinarily yeah, they nearly always span more than one financial year, or very often span more than one financial year. So you'll have uh, prior year spend and you'll have future year spend as well. And that picture is not, um, that's not really spelled out uh, in, the, uh, in, the fork, uh, in the monitoring report. So that's something that we will be looking to, to improve. Um, alongside, of course, the, uh, the aforementioned review, affordability review of the capital programme. And, and, of course, the, uh, the revenue budget. So... The details are in the, in the report. Again, I won't go through all the details. Just to pick up on a couple of uh, 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 more obvious points, if you like, Chair. Uh, in paragraphs 8 and 9, the net financing costs forecast on this spend by about 780k. As I say, this again is down to the pace of the capital programme, so it has a knock-on effect on borrowing costs. 
Uh, so therefore, it's more about timing differences rather than uh, rather than a large chunk of money that's going to land in the council's bank account, if you like. Uh, just one point of interest, um, because as I say, part of the affordability review is or one of the reasons for doing the affordability review. Of course, is that we we are at the moment facing increasing interest rates. Um, we, we've, uh, as reported before, we have um, locked in some cheap borrowing, but you know, interest rates are on the rise, so we need to be very mindful of that. Uh, but there is a, a good news story, if there can be a good news story to that, is that, and that is uh, that we are starting to get a return on our call accounts, uh, which we weren't getting before, because the uh, interest rates on call accounts, when we set the budget, they were, they were literally running at something like 0.01 to 0.05 per cent. So they were very, very low, and we made no uh, estimate of getting much in the way of uh, interest income from those call accounts. So we think we're going to get around about £190,000, £200,000 this year. So there is, there is a slight upside to the, uh, to the negative side of, um, of increased interest rates, which I thought um, uh, members would, would be interested in. Uh, so not really much else to say uh, about the capital programme, but just uh, I would say that about the, intra, uh, the, sorry, the collection rates on uh, council tax and business rates, they are pretty much uh, um, the same as last year's, very, very minor differences. Uh, I think, as I said in the previous report, it was good that we were able to ride through the, um, you know, the, the, pan the storm of the pandemic, if you like, and lock, uh, the impact of lockdown. And it seemed to have a very marginal impact on our collection rates. Uh, as members are, I'm sure, well aware, we've got uh, a cost of living crisis now. And I, I don't know, I have no um, firm data to, to support this statement, but I think we need to be mindful of the fact that uh, the, the current economic situation that is facing the, uh, the country, it, it may for some prove to be the, the straw that breaks the camel's back. So we've got to, got to bear that in mind whilst we're... Whilst well, we're looking at these collection rates, we've got to, it'll be very interesting to see to keep an eye on them and see how they see how they bear up during the financial year. So again, it's a positive story, but um, notwithstanding the points I've made about uh, interest rates, cost of living crisis, and the affordability review that we need to do, uh, and I st would still repeat that the uh, delivery of the um, uh, property investment strategy and particularly the financial stability programme continues to be of paramount importance to the Council if we are to, uh, to uh, achieve a sustainable budget that doesn't rely on the uh, drawdown of reserves. Um, that's it from me, Chair. Again, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Tony. And I think we all uh, realise it's all uncertainty. You know, there's nothing that's certain there. And, um, but where we are is um, uh, uh, a position that's obviously better than what we had forecast originally. Uh, Ash is... Any comments you'd like to make uh, at this stage or any other members that wanted to make a question of Tony? I'll deal with Kevin's question first, Ash, if that's okay. Kevin? Thank you, Chairman. Um, just a couple of questions. Have we dealt with possible increases in electricity in, in the budget now? And secondly, strategy and planning. Um, we've got an overspend on staff resources, um, which in a way is good because we want to reduce our, our planning issues. But am I right in thinking that our planning applications are way short of, uh, the, the income from planning applications is way short of what we're spending on staff. And we can't increase the planning charges to cover what we're actually spending. And, and therefore, what can we do about that? And is there any lobbying that needs to be done? Because clearly, um, that paragraph there, where we've we spent 242,000 and got in an extra 120, that's um, economics, of the, economics of the madhouse, as often we say. I'll try and remember some of those questions, Chair. <laughs> to take the uh, the electricity one first of all, uh, we have in the um, y you'll see in the, in the appendix A that there's a line in their budget contingency. So uh, I think we have two hundred thousand pounds in there. The cost of the electricity contract kicks in around about September October, I think, Chair. Uh, and I don't have the number off the top of my head, but we will have enough in the way of budget contingency to absorb that particular pressure. That being said, there are uh, there are dozens of other pressures um, queuing up behind it, but uh, mm -hmm. hopefully that that answers Councillor Dixon, uh, okay. Councillor Dixon's question in that yeah. respect. That's as full as I can get it at the moment. Okay, thank you, Tony. Shall, shall I invite Ben to deal with the second part of that question? Uh, okay, yeah. you, is that right with you, Ben? Yeah. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, the I mean, in regards to the obviously the the, the, the comment about planning, you're right. Um, we have uh, the. That 122,000 primarily relates to the additional resource that's required through 
the, the capital staffing as well as the interim development manager. Um, we have spent more on additional resources coming in. As you said, that's been offset by additional income. We are continuing to drive additional income as much as possible through the implementation of planning performance agreements um, and pre the pre-app advice service as well, both of which are seeing quite a significant increase and in, continue to drive that income this year. So hopefully, yes, whilst at the moment there's, there's, there's a deficit in that, we do hope to drive that down throughout the course of the financial year. If I can ask a supplementary, why can't we increase our planning charges to cover what we're spending? And if we can't by legislation, then what can we do about getting that legislation changed? Because clearly... We can't carry on spending money like that. I, th I, think, I think you've sort of hit the nail on the head yourself there. It's a, it's a government issue. It's, uh, it's, it's controlled by regulation on what we can charge, and therefore it can only be changed on a national level rather than, rather than what we can do here. We continue to work through the LGA and the Planning Advisory Service to address these issues, but it's the same sorts of issues that um, planning uh, authorities are facing all over the country and that the income generated from applications is not sufficient to cover resource costs um, by any stretch. Can we do something about it? Can we actually say here today that we're going to lobby someone to do something about it because it's okay talking about it, but we have to have a change? Okay, if I can just ask Malcolm to make a comment and then I'll go to Jonathan. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, yes, yes, we can lobby. We can approach our, our local MPs. We can. Uh, we will continue, as Ben said, to work through the LGA and the, the Planning Advisory Service. But as a note from tonight, I will take away to raise it with the, the two local MPs. They are aware of it, but it does no harm to raise it again. So thank you, Kevin. Yeah, thank you for raising that, Kevin. Uh, Jonathan. Okay, there are quite a few issues here, and I think it's worth putting most of them on the table. Um, in turn, yes, we have fixed charges. The government has said that they are proposing to increase the, the, the charges in the, you know, this whole levelling up procedure. Uh, when that comes through, I don't know, but they, are, they have recognised that uh, there isn't sufficient funds. Um, the part of that deficit is because there are a lot of small applications which take time, you know, sometimes as much as a little medium-sized application. So the proportion of money you get for the time that you put in uh, has a negative effect. Now, having said that, we all know that we have a backlog and uh, we've had a meeting with, uh, with Malcolm and with Ben and with Miles about continuing to reduce the number of applications because we need to get the number of applications down to a, a uh, sustainable level, a level that, that, is, that, that uh, the resource covers. That would seem to be about 350 to 400 PS1 and PS2 applications. So uh, there is... Miles is working on that, and the intention is to get it down to 400 by the end of December. We're meeting at the end of September to review it, so it's a, an absolute ongoing review. But part of the issue is also um, changing the way we perhaps process some of the smaller applications so they have a um, uh, they don't have to go through quite as rigorous processes as they are now. Uh, I think you know to that's, and that's not talking about shortcutting, it's just talking about being more pragmatic, and I know Miles, through Ben, is working on that as well. So there's a whole lot of things going on that, uh, that, that create that problem, and they're quite, they're quite long-term entrenched problems that not only us, that other um, authorities have. But if we can speed up small applications, because they're the ones that really drain that resource, then that will go a long way and actually clear that backlog. So, but I think, I think everything is on the right trajectory, not helped by the fact that the early part of this year we had a, quite a significant increase in the number of applications on hand. I think, I think in three months we, you know, we, we, we picked up about five months' worth of applications. I might not have that figure exactly right, but it's of that order. And that doesn't help when you're really trying to push things backwards. So uh, all in all, directionally it's correct. Let's hope the government does come through with the funds. And also remember that about a million quid's worth of the uh, planning cost is, uh, is the policy department against which there is virtually no income. I think there may be something, but I think there's, I think there's no income. So it is a direct cost the council must bear against no income. Yeah, thank you for the explanation, Jonathan. Um, any other questions regarding this report, agenda item 8? 
No, if we can look to move the report, um, if I can invite you, Ash, please. Yeah, thank you. I think the, the report um, clearly summarises the quarter one position. I think the key thing that um, Tony and I were talking through um, was around the clarity for the end-to-end -end projects. I'm really pleased to see that that's now going to be displayed moving forward, just so we've got that end-to-end -end journey. Um, so, yeah, thank you. Um, and I think I'd move the report, please. Thank you. And second report, uh, Kevin, thank you. And uh, those in favour, that's unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. I don't know if you can hear that, but I'll just say to Kate Joe, uh, Head of Service, Housing and Community, your report on the anti-poverty strategy, please. Thank you, Chair. And hello, everybody. <coughs> Excuse me. So this um, report has been through the um, overview and scrutiny proce uh, process and um, is recommended to you uh, today, this evening. You'll remember, I hope, that the um, overview and scrutiny committee commissioned a, a anti poverty task and finish group that met um, over the broadly, really, over the, over the period of the pandemic and, and, and just beforehand, um, and brought recommendations to you um, to form a draft, which has been consulted upon for six weeks. Um, and the draft, as it is, can be found at Appendix A of the report. In total, we received 66 responses um, from the public, as well as 25 responses from local organisations, which is a good, fairly healthy response, and, and a lot of interest in, in, in the... Uh, content of the strategy, the draft strategy, that, that, that can be found, a more comprehensive summary can be found at Appendix B of the report. To remind you all again, the, the, the main objectives agreed and, and um, approved by uh, Cabinet were, were the need for greater coordination, better access, improved access to services, and, and better promotion of what everyone is doing across the, the system, as it were, and then the network of services that that operate in, in the area of alleviating the symptoms of poverty locally. Um, of course, members will be aware of the, the, the great array of and, and quality of services that are out there in the community um, and, um, and in statutory provision as well. And, and, and that's really a key theme of the Anti-Poverty Task and Finish Group, really, and their recommendations was to, to celebrate the, the great work that is out there, but also acknowledging the, the shortfall in, in, in need that's out there as well and a timely report today this evening I think in terms of the you know the, the rising challenges emerging from cost of living which have been raised in other contexts um, this evening and other reports and and the fact that as a authority we may be constrained and limited in terms of the scope of what we can do directly but as leaders in the community as an institution in, in a leadership position it is beholden perhaps on us to, to coordinate locally um, the activity that is out there and make sure that what the resources we do have is as effective as possible. So to that end, a lot of the, the um, feedback we received, particularly from other organisations, highlighted the need for greater integration or, or, or the importance of the integration of this strategy with existing strategies, such as the ha our own housing and homelessness rough sleeper strategy, the local plan, economic development strategies, but also, um, for example, the Hastings and Rother Food Networks, food and security strategy for Rother, and making sure that we, um, again, take a whole system approach to what we're doing and, and make ensure that we are coherent across the whole system in terms of how services are delivered, coordinated, but also accessed. In particular, East Sussex County Council Public Health and the Clinical Commissioning Group drew attention to the strong alignment of the objectives of the strategy with the um, emerging, well, now adopted and, and live, which is probably the right word, integrated care system um, in East Sussex, which um, launched formally on the 1st of July and replacing uh, the commissioning of health services as becoming across Sussex. And Councillor Barnes at, at Scrutiny was apt to point out the legacy of, 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 of the uh, East Sussex Better Together partnership that has been in East Sussex for many years and um, the, indeed has been a, a totem or, 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 or of the integrated care system as it is now across the country. And um, that we have good levels of integration in East Sussex as a consequence. And we need to make sure as a district that we align ourselves effectively to those networks. So we 
We have um, a consultant working very, a consultant in public health working very closely with us, who's their strategy lead, and um, she has latterly become very influential locally in terms of dictating the the future, perhaps, of the strategy as it is. And, and Councillor um, Coleman and myself have, have been very impressed with her level of knowledge and expertise in this area, and is perhaps something that at a district level we we found. Um, challenging to sort of really get into get into this in truth because of the other competing range of priorities we're trying to manage and it, and we really need to align ourselves to what public health east sussex are doing and make sure that we maximize our impact locally and to that end the strategy before you which is in in, in every iteration that's come before you has acknowledged that it's relatively modest in its scope and relatively modest in what it's trying to achieve and really important in keeping our objectives specific and measurable and achievable um, and these are very achievable objectives uh, one of the principal objectives of of the strategy though is to uh, emerging in the recommendations is that we use it as a platform as a stepping stone towards a, a greater a strategy perhaps with a greater scope in terms of becoming more holistic of health and well-being more generally um, and something acknowledged already by the work program of overview and scrutiny in terms of potential for development of uh, an amalgam of the anti-poverty agenda and perhaps his broader anti-poverty strategy. The report highlights the, the um, alignment, particularly in terms of the priority to address inequalities and in outcome, which are part of the integrated care system, which are very strongly aligned to, to the strategy. And a range of other key factors that the Health Foundation, for example, has identified as main drivers of health inequality, money and resources, unemployment, housing, transport, neighbourhood and surroundings, families and communities. That, that idea that, that health is, is a, um, has wider determinants, including many of the things we manage directly. So in, so in conclusion, I, I would recommend this strategy to you for adoption um, as, 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 as the um, Overview and Scrutiny Committee, and that we need to um, come back, hopefully in, 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 in short order and in the near future, with a more comprehensive uh, health and well-being strategy with, with the direction and, and, and um, partnership of public health and wider partners and the steering group that we're recommending be um, adopted or formed as well to oversee this a multi-agency steering group of, of relevant partners. So we're happy to take questions, Chair, and I hope that's given you a summary or flavour of what the report contains. Okay, I'll invite questions before I then invite um, Councillor um, Sam Coleman, who's been very much involved in bringing this together. Um, Councillor Catherine Field. Catherine. Yes, thank you. And thank you very much to Mr. Parr for that presentation. I think at its most basic level, poverty is not having enough money to live on. But it is about so much more than that, isn't it? As this report alludes to, and as Mr. Powell has said, having heard public health person from East Sussex Lord, and her last name escapes me because it's complicated, speak about this, it is clear that people's health and well-being affects their poverty levels and that everything we do, every service we have, touches upon how people live and how people live comfortably and how they live well. And it's not just us, um, as Mr Powell said, we need to make absolutely sure we are integrating this. And in fact, Lord has integrated our strategy in with hers um, and that all agencies we deal with understand that our residents and their well-being um, are absolutely paramount. Um, and it's about how we run our parks, it's about, it's about feeding them, it's about housing people, it's about making sure that the roads they walk down are comfortable and safe so they can have normal interactions with themselves and their families at very, very basic levels. So I'm very glad this is here and I'm very glad to be able to endorse it um, and look forward to further reports about how we are actually integrating on a practical level what we do here with what everybody else does to try and help all our residents. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Catherine. Um, if I... Yep. Councillor Rossu Project, Sue. Thank you. Um, thank you for the report. And congratulations to Councillor Coleman for driving this one forward. And we, we have got a bit of a success record on task finish groups on this council. But often they sit, sit in a drawer somewhere, if, if they can be found again, and they're not checked, examined, and seeing how they go. But you've built into this a way of actually making sure that something gets done by having the anti-poverty steering group. And 
but also by having the local strategic partnership actually look at it too, because there you've got all the agencies that come together. And that's an ideal body to actually get an integrated, coherent was the word you use. And even if you achieve just that, my goodness, you've come a long way. Because one of the things people are, well, certainly from the Hair Project, they don't know where to go. They don't know what's out there, who to contact. And so if we could make that signposting real, but all, and, and in the rural areas as well as Bexhill, um, because it's, it's so important for people to be able to get the information. And I, th I think one of the things that this project has shown, and COVID showed, is actually Rye Food Bank. They had enormous increase in use, Rye Food Bank. And what the manager there did is sat down with people who came in and asked them why they were here. So the list you gave, there were about 11 things on the list. And as Councillor Field has said, it's absolutely every service we we offer, we use. And like climate change, it should be built into officers' thinking when, when they make decisions and when we make decisions. So I really look forward to the rest of the work on this and the future of it. And congratulations again, Councillor Palmer. Uh, thank you, Sue. Um, Christine, Councillor Bates. Yes, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, um, Chair. Um, well, I would like to obviously echo um, my congratulations to Mr. Powell and Councillor Coleman for uh, an excellent um, document and strategy and the work they've done um, has been really impressive and effective. I mean, the report that we've got could have been you know, full of hyperbole, platitudes, soft soaping. I mean, we have seen examples of that, I think, in other authorities um, where they have developed a, you know, um, you know very grand-sounding anti-poverty strategy that actually doesn't deliver. This is different. This is practical. It's supportive. It brings people together and, and you know, commands support across a range of, a, a range of um, organisations. But Councillor Prochak and Councillor Field are right. It needs to join up uh, with other bits of the council. And I've always thought of myself, I suppose, because of my political background, that actually my economic development work and my regeneration work is actually all about anti-poverty. It's all about creating good um, quality employment for people. Um, and... Um, you know, uh, that sort of, you know, like, if you like, that one piece of the jigsaw puzzle that it eventually, in time, will create a picture uh, where we have, by and large, eradicated uh, the worst aspects of poverty from, uh, from the district. Um, so I look forward to the work on uh, linking across to health inequalities, and I look, I look forward to contributing from my regeneration and economic uh, development. But big congratulations to Councillor Coleman and Mr Powell. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Christine. If I can invite um, Councillor Paul Osborne, the uh, chair of the scrutiny committee, to um, make some comments and then I can go externally. I, I've got um, Councillor Carl Maynard waiting to, to speak. And are you waiting to speak as well, Charlie? I think you are. Yeah, OK. Just bear with me and I'll call you in in a couple of moments. OK, Paul. Thank you, Chairman. Yes, as you say, this, um, this came, came past our um, scrutiny meeting last week um, in this very room. Um, basically, there's not a lot to add because the work was done for us. Um, we had an excellent um, working group made up of members across the council, across the political spectrum, if you like, um, and ably chaired by, by Councillor Coleman. Um, obviously worked with, with Joe as well and, and, and his team. So, um, so everything through this is, is, is good, basically, and that's, that's all I can say. Um, the, the recommendation is, um, is as you see it, um, the anti-poverty strategy be recommended to Cabinet and then on to full council for adoption. But more importantly, um, the second part, is to note that the anti-poverty steering group will form or reform or, or won't go away anyway um, to, to keep an eye on things 
um, and make sure it it goes forward. And that is that is all we we want to know that it that it works and it will be reported on a regular basis back to scrutiny as well for, for progress and progression. And and Councillor Coleman has, has told us as that's what he will be keeping an eye on with his position as as um, cabinet. Uh, Cabinet spokesman on, or council spokesman, I suppose, on financial poverty. So, um, to be honest, it's all good. Thank you very much, Paul. I'll go uh, externally, uh, Sam, and then you can sum up, and then Terry can perhaps move the uh, report. Um, Carl, would you like to... Um... Thank you very much indeed. Only to declare an interest in this item, um, in, because in Joe's comprehensive introduction, he obviously referenced... Um, the ICS and the changes and the, and the role um, of public health. Um, so I declare an interest as executive member at East Sussex County Council for Adult Social Care and Public Health. And whilst I've got the floor, if, I, if you'd indulge me, Chairman, I'll also declare an interest in agenda item 10, such as I'm sure the East Sussex County Council role in that project may also come forward. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, thank you, Carl. Uh, Councillor Charlie Clark. <coughs> thank you, Chairman. I just want to make some brief comments, similar to what I made at uh, scrutiny. Um, I welcome the report, and um, it's very timely, considering the problems that low-income families are having at the moment. But um, I'm pleased that the, the council is doing everything it can to support people through the council tax reduction scheme and the hardship scheme and the money we receive from the government for the household support fund, where a family can get up to £150 in supermarket vouchers, which a number of people in my ward and other wards have been picking up on. So um, I feel, as a council, we're doing as much as we can practically to help as many people as we can, but um, it is a matter of working with other organisations to actually deliver on the strategy of the Anti-Poverty uh, Committee. But um, I feel rather are doing what they can, and I, I'm sure residents appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for those comments, Charlie. Uh, appreciate it. And if I can ask Councillor uh, Sam Coleman to uh, uh, tie in all that's been said up to now, Sam, please. Thank you, Chair. And, and thanks to Joe and his team um, for all their hard work on this, uh, as well as Claire from RVA, uh, the anti poverty Task and Finish Group, uh, Lourdes, as we heard, uh, and all of the external organisations who gave testimony, provided key information throughout the process, actually, including the recent consultation, uh, and I really do hope this piece of work does justice uh, to the intentions of, of all those involved. Um, this work started when my colleagues and I were elected in 2019 on pledges to make Mother District Council fairer uh, and better support those facing hardship. Uh, and I'm really happy to see that pay off today. Really, though, the genesis of this, for me at least, goes right back to the early 2010s when, uh, as a young carer, I saw the benefits and help that my family had slashed whilst the cost of living rose, something that saw us forced out of private rental accommodation and onto the council's homelessness register. And I, and I say this not for sympathy, but because this is a story all too common for people on lower incomes. Um, whether it's a worker struggling for employment or decent pay, parents struggling to raise a family, someone with lifelong conditions being forced to means test and falsely deemed fit for work, someone facing discrimination for their protected characteristics, finding that support mechanisms like legal aid have been cut. Whatever the situation, anyone without the necessary resources to weather imposed hardships will have suffered as a result of the austerity project, a project that saw food banks in every county grow busier and busier, that saw child poverty, homelessness and deprivation indexes spiral, a project that saw supportive welfare provisions cut and replaced with universal credits, that saw community centres, sure start centres and subsidised nurseries closed down, a project that made the poor poorer as they were forced to pay for bankers' blunders and catch the falling dominoes of failed deregulation, a project that stripped local councils of all of their central funding, leaving the cost of council services squarely on the shoulders of taxpayers and capital investments. That is why my colleagues and I asked the question in 2019, what could we do better? Given our financial limitations and the limited responsibilities we hold as a district council, what could we do better? And this strategy before you today is the first important step in answering that question. By working with external partners and organisations and giving direction to the local strategic partnership and the steering group, we can improve access, coordination and promotion of hardship relief and support services 
and in turn do our bit to help shift the balance of resources more fairly and more equi equitably to those who need it most. Now, as it happens, this couldn't have come at a more necessary time, as many have said. Uh, on top of the consequences of austerity, we have seen the triple whammy of stagnant wages, low economic growth, and rising prices, all compounded by a global pandemic, Brexit frictions, uh, all, which, all which have led uh, many working people to fall into hardship, some for the first time in their lives, as the cost of living gets harder to manage. Every single councillor uh, will have residents affected by this. Uh, every single company will have staff affected by this, including this council. Uh, and that is why this project cannot end here. Now, it's true that ultimately the burden of the current cost of living crisis can only be eased fully through big changes at a national level. Um, but we cannot pass that buck without doing every single thing in our power first. That is why it is crucial that this strategy is monitored by the council and that work begins with partners to look at this wider health and well-being strategy. Um, with combating health inequalities and alleviating the causes and symptoms of poverty at its heart, drawing on the emerging work of partners like East Sussex County Council and the CCG, and also strengthening the resilience of our local communities through bolstering our own hardship safety nets. These are bleak and tricky times that could well get worse before they get better, and our communities are counting on us. Uh, in September, I plan to bring a motion to Council to declare a cost of living crisis, uh, and it's incumbent on all of us to prioritise those determined, resilient, hard-working people who are hitting the breadline and in need of support. As part of that, I wish to highlight in particular struggles of marginalised groups who face extra barriers and thus greater burdens in times like these. And not enough work has been done in this area yet as a council, in my view. And it's, important, it's an important step I would like to be considered moving forward. As for today, I hope this document achieves its goals and creates a solid foundation for further action against hardship. And I am honoured to recommend the anti-poverty strategy to Cabinet for adoption. Thank you. Well, thank you very much indeed, uh, Sam. And I think most people would go along with what you said, and I think that this is um, part of this collaborative working which, uh, under Joe's guidance, has brought this forward. And I think we all feel that health and well-being is the wrapper around all our residents because everything affects it, be it homes, housing, leisure, everything about it affects the quality of life that's out there and uh, thank you very much indeed for um, leading this and Joe, thank you very much for keeping a, a very close eye <coughs> and bringing other groups together. If I could ask uh, Councillor Terry Byrne to um, move this report please. Thank you Chair. Well, uh, almost everything's been said. Uh, Councillor Coleman gave us a, 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 a wonderful tour, if you like, through all the pressures that have been caused, regardless of your political views, families have been under pressure after pressure after pressure. However, let us look. If you look at paragraph two on the, on the strategy in front of you, it says, in autumn 2021, a multi-agency event was held. Lots of the pressures were not there yet. We didn't have the, the unemployment caused by the, by the pandemic. We didn't have the massive cost in uh, raw materials. We didn't have the massive cost in fuel. We didn't have the massive cost in food, in energy. So this was really a strategy just in the right place. But it speaks of Rother's concern even before those, those big items came through. Rother was concerned enough. And this was a concern across all parties. And therefore, we set up the, the strategy. Now, I won't, won't go into uh, anything. It's all been said. But I think the very important bit, uh, and in moving this poverty anti-poverty strategy, I would say, I'll read again paragraphs one and two of the recommendations. The anti-poverty strategy be approved and adopted. Yeah, okay. But the big one, as people have said, is paragraph two. It'd be noted that an anti-poverty steering group will be formed to oversee the delivery of the strategy action plan, as well as inform the development of a broader health and well-being strategy for Rother. Now, the broader health and well-being strategy coming out of county, you could almost say, well, well, where were you when we set this up in the first place? We've done a lot of work. This group has done a marvellous amount of work that can feed in to that. And what we've now got to do is pull those two things together and make an overall strategy. So uh, let's not 
quibble about who thought of what first. Let's move forward and make sure that these strategy, this strategy generates real actions. I'm confident that it will when I look at the, the, uh, when I look at the composition of the anti-poverty steering group. And so for that, matter, for that reason, I'm, I'm very happy, Chairman, to move this report. Well, thank you very much, Terry. Uh, someone to second that report? Secretary, do you want to make a comment, Catherine? Yes, I'm sorry. I think I should have declared I'm a member of East Sussex County Council. Right, but it's not peculiar. Yeah. It's thank you. Yes, thank you, Chair. I, I've just got one question um, to ask, uh, which, which you may rule out of order. Um, I was having a conversation the other day with um, Chris Watchman from our benefits team who was talking about a rejigging of the household support grant because there is one category of claimant, uh, uh, I think it might be the pensioners um, scheme, which is not, not being claimed. The, the scheme for families is, is virtually claimed for, uh, but, the pen, but the scheme for pensioners has not been claimed. And I just wondered if them, it, this, this seemed an appropriate item to ask you know, what we're doing about that particular piece of work. I'll invite Lorna to answer that. She seemed to indicate that she might be able to. Yeah, I, I believe we are looking at the scheme. I think we've looked at this across the county as well. Um, so there is a discretionary element to the scheme and um, Chris has been working with um, officers across the county to come up with a slight revision to it. I, th I think um, Councillor Jiwan has has seen that and approved it under his delegation. So that, that, that has been noted and taken forward. So. And we can, and we'll be able to promote that to our residents. I mean, I have a high proportion of um, pensioners um, living in my yeah. ward. Yeah, I mean, we, we, we are, um, because there is quite a backlog in processing in, in the team at the moment, we are kind of um, staggering the communication that goes out so we don't get overwhelmed. So um, as soon as we can promote, we'll be pushing it out and certainly we'll be relying on members sharing that with, with their residents. Okay, thank you for clarification of that, Lorna. Um, where were we? Um, you've moved it and, Christine, you've seconded it. So if we can take a vote on that, thank you very much indeed. And that's unanimous. And um, as been mentioned before, the timing of this is really quite um, um, crucial as well. You know, we do seem to be a little bit ahead of the curve on this one, Joe. I would like to think so. So, um, well done in recognising what we need to be doing. So, where are we? Item 10. Um, right. Ben, um, the Ravenside Gateway Roundabout Improvement Project update. Councillor Field? I think I need to declare her as well. Personal interest, member of East Sussex County Council. Okay, fair enough. Redeclare mine, Chairman. Um, from above, okay, here we go then, Ben, if you can uh, lead this report in. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman, yes. Uh, so this report relates to the, um, uh, the Bexhill Ravenside roundabout, uh, for which two years ago, uh, full council uh, attributed £150,000 of the Bexhill Local Community Infrastructure Levy Fund. Uh, which was collected uh, from, from development in Bexhill prior to the formation of the Bexhill-on-Sea Town Council. Um, this report basically gives a, a very brief update as to, as to the stagnation of that project, primarily based on the, uh, the frustrations in engaging with national highways, for whom other issues have been a priority, um, as well as um, the, the, the presence of an invasive uh, plant species there in horsetail, which is going to require a series of treatments over a period of time before any further works can take place on that roundabout. I would say uh, that, that following uh, intervention from the, the, the local MP, we've had um, uh, it, the, uh, the, the engagement with National Highways has now improved, and we are looking to progress this project, but not at any, any particular pace given the invasive species present there. So given the fact that it's been allocated £150,000 of the Bexhill Sea uh, sorry, the Bexhill uh, Local Community Infrastructure Levy. Uh, it's recommended that uh, a recommendation go to council to deallocate that funding from this particular project, making it available for other projects to be discussed later in, on the agenda, um, which would create a, a pot of about £218,000 available for that spend. 
That doesn't mean to say that this project will cease. We're recommending keeping it on the capital programme uh, and that we seek other funding uh, funding uh, avenues for, for that as and when the time is appropriate but it just means that that funding doesn't sit there stagnant doing nothing in the interim whilst whilst National Highways overcome the issues on that roundabout before we implement something. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, Ben. It has been a terribly frustrating uh, two and a bit years, almost three years in dealing with National Highways who were National Highways England before uh, with personnel changes and all the other issues that beset them. Um, um, but we are making some progress towards that, and it does appear that, that it could be on a, on a, on a two-project, um, two-phase basis. Um, uh, Councillor Timpe, would you like to make any observations on the report, please? Yeah, yeah, I, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> this is disappointing, obviously, that it's taken so long, but I totally agree with the reallocation of funds, and there are other <coughs> things that need, uh, need doing. Um, we're not going to give up, though. Um, we're, we're still in um, conversation with National Highways, finally. It took a long while to actually even identify anybody that you could talk to. Um, but um, we're currently trying to pull together an actual Teams meeting, which is, um, doesn't sound particularly brilliant, but believe me, that's such <laughs> progress that we can actually try and get people on screen so that we can talk about the concerns because not only um, is there horsetail on the roundabout, the safety engineers have significant concerns uh, because it, they, in their terms they think it's a major roundabout and there are all sorts of issues safety-wise. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a, a, a big issue and county obviously have been very supportive of this and we hope that they're still going to sponsor it uh, but we need to check back that they're still going to support that. But Donna, um, who's currently on, on leave, um, she's, she's driving this project for us. So it's sort of watch this space, really, and I expect we'll be applying for SIL funding um, when and if highways agree. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hazel. Uh, Councillor Charlie Clark. Charlie, you're on mute. Sorry, Chairman. Yeah, this has been a problem for me in my war for over 20 years, this roundabout. And uh, if you go along there today, it's an absolute disgrace. It's all overgrown. It's a terrible mess. This is a gateway to Bexhill from Hastings. And um, over the years, they've, they've changed the name. They've changed the personnel. Highways England, Highways Agency. And it's very difficult to get any concrete answers out of them. Um, I report it regularly as a health and safety issue because the overgrowth is so bad that it's a problem for drivers. And they tell me, well, we're only responsible for the sight line. We're not responsible for the roundabout at all, running the sight line. And they come up with things like, well, we can't work on a roundabout because we'd have to have a road, road closure order because it's health and safety. I mean, Somebody has got to get a contractor in place to get on that damn roundabout and remove all this evasive problem plants, concrete it over, and put up a beautiful something like um, a car that would promote Bexel's heritage and motoring. So we've actually got something there, and it seems we have an impasse. Now, I do worry that this might get kicked into long grass, we won't get the funding. And it would just go on and on. And it's, it, it, it's very, very disheartening, you know. It really is. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm sure it won't be kicked into any long grass or horsetail grass or whatever, Charlie. Uh, I think it's important that now that we've got operatives that we can make contact with at National Highways um, and that we will go forward on it. Um, so, yeah, Councillor Byrne. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm really going to echo uh, Councillor Clark's point. It seems that highways have said... The only thing we can do is eliminate horse's tail, and that takes a year. Is that a given? As Councillor Park says, there, there are other things we could do with that roundabout that don't necessarily mean a year-long elimination of a particular invasive species. So I just hope this isn't another kick it into the long grass or kick the can down the road. It just worried me that this, oh, well, that will take a year at least. It was, I almost heard them say, oh, that's that out of the way for a year. So I, I hope, and I'm quite certain, 
my colleague, Councillor Tempe, will not let that excuse <laughs> go unchallenged. Thank you. No, I'm sure it won't. And now that we're in dialogue with um, National Highways, I think there will be some progress. It's been an unbelievable, slow, slow, painful process. Thank you, Chairman. And, and this is a disappointing report, at the, uh, unfortunately. But this is the right decision because still, still money is a stream of funding that will be continuous. And it is important that we keep the money uh, being spent rather than sitting on money for a long time. Um, one thing I'd like to ask for, I don't think it's necessary to change the recommendation, but um, I would like a clear and unequivocal um, press release following this decision to explain to people why this decision has had to be made. And while we don't really want to point fingers, but whose fault it is that this cannot go forward at this time, because I do believe that um, we will get a lot of blame where it is not our fault, it's not our roundabout. Um, and, and we've tried to do something for the good of the community and other people have not been as forthcoming as we were with doing this. So I do think it's important that we, we, we tell people what we've tried to do and, and where the blockages have been. And maybe a little bit of um, public pressure will help. Can I also ask, has, I believe, has the MP been involved in this? Uh, yes, he did. Um, the MP was very, very helpful in trying to loosen up the... Uh, the bureaucracy in getting through to the right person, but unfortunately that person was on long-term sickness, but he's now back from sickness, and we're uh, with Donna Hall, we are now putting a meeting together. So hopefully that will make some real progress. But it's not our roundabout, so we can't go out there and just do what we want to do um, without permission. Um, ben, I, I'm sure that we can deal with some form of um, informative press release. Um, I think that's very, very important. Um, Hazel, you move this report? Uh, I move the report. Somebody to second this report? Yep, Christine, thank you. And if we can vote, um, please, that's uh, unanimous. Thank you very much indeed. And um, bear with us, Charlie. I'm sure we'll make some real progress in this next um, few months. Last agenda item, devolution of public conveniences in Bexhill. Um, this is Lorna's report. Thank you, Lorna. Thank you, Chair. Um, so over the last 10 years since the Localism Act came in, um, we've had um, a quite ad hoc approach to devolution. We had had some successes, um, but we're now accelerating that program um, of devolution. Um, so this, this was a priority in our corporate plan. Um, one of the main actions was to set up a town council in Bexhill, which has obviously been done. And then the second part of that was to identify and agree which assets and services uh, we'd look to devolve. Um, back in March, the Cabinet approved an approach, and this is set out in paragraph four of your report, um, setting out options around um, a, a number of assets and services that the Council provides at the moment, so around um, public conveniences, um, grounds maintenance, and um, free car parks in, in, in the district. So um, we've already set out our, our, our approach, and this report's really just bringing forward... Um, how we're going to tackle the, the devolution in Bakes Hill. The Town Council itself, at a full council meeting back in April, um, agreed to commence negotiations with us, and I've been working very closely with the Town Clerk there to bring forward um, some proposals. Um, when, when I first looked at this, I was quite surprised that we had 14 public conveniences in Bakes Hill. That, that did seem like rather a lot. Um, and the other thing was, was to hear that actually this was a real priority for our residents in terms of improving them. So as part of the big uh, survey that the Town Council did, well, one of the priorities for improvement was the public conveniences. So I think we have a, a mandate there to look at things a bit differently, and it certainly gives a mandate to the Town Council to take this on and actually push forward and make sure we've, we've got good facilities um, in the town. Um, um, we've also been speaking to a number of community organisations, um, so there's an opportunity um, with the Bowls Club at the Pole Grove and at Manor Barn and the Old Town, um, Be Bexhill Old Town Preservation Society to also ha have a look at taking some of these facilities on. So that's still open, it's still on the table, and in Appendix A it does set out all the um, facilities we have in Bexhill and where we are in terms of those discussions. So I think it's important that the Town Council or a community organisation know um, what they are taking on. So we have commissioned some condition surveys. Um, ho hopefully they, they, will they will kick off shortly. 
And, you know, that, that may throw up that it's not worth the investment in some of the facilities and the town council may choose not to go, go forward with some of them. They have indicated that they are interested in all of them at the moment, but that may tell us something um, new. Um, this, in the report, we also propose to earmark up to £218,000 um, and, use, and, and use of that local SIL money to enable the facilities to be improved. Um, and this will be made available for the town council or community organisations to undertake any refurbishments necessary. Um, so another strategic objective of the corporate plan is financial stability. We've already heard from Tony about how important the FSP is and making sure that we actually deliver the savings and efficiencies in there um, so we can balance the budget without the need to draw on reserves. Um, so the devolution workstream is a really important part of the FSP. Um, and it is worth noting that if we were to devolve all 14 facilities in Bexhill, we'd, we'd realise a saving about, of just over £137,000, and that's savings on cleaning, repairs, insurance, utilities, and so on. And I think the other important thing to mention here is that it increases the capacity of some really stretched teams in the council, and that's the neighbourhood services team and the estates team. So if you put all that together, I can see that this is a really positive thing, both for us and the community. Um, but there is the, de the devolution of, of, of the public conveniences is part of a larger project around devolution. Um, it has two phases. The first phase is really about the public conveniences in Bex Hill um, to be transferred by April 23. But we've also started to um, engage with the town councils at Rye and Bex Hill and other local councils to find out what they might be interested on, in, in taking on. And th that will then form part of phase two and we will look to actually make those transfers or, or, or devolve those assets by April 24. So that's the bigger programme. Um, this report seeks agreement to make a recommendation to Council in September, um, and, it, uh, and we're seeking here the principle to transfer the toilets in Bexhill to the Town Council on a long-term lease from April 23, um, to recommend the use of up to 218,000 of local SIL funds, uh, to the Town Council and possibly other community groups as well, um, and that I've granted delegated authority to facilitate this process further, enter into leases in consultation with the leader portfolio holders to agree those terms. Thanks, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, Lorna. Are there any questions on this report, please, for Lorna? Catherine, Catherine, if you want. Um, yes. First of all, why are we devolving on a lease? Because that will still leave us with a residual problem won't it? Secondly, um, I have witnessed painful process of devolution in the past um, and actually I would like some assurance that legal services will be able to get on with this quite quickly. And thirdly, looking at the matrix at the end, which is what I always do, um, I do think this item has a real significant effect on crime and disorder and also equalities. Um, people have to be able to access a lavatory if they need it. And we do know that in some places they are absolute hubs for crime. So I think that needs acknowledging. Thank you. Um, yes, you're, you're right actually about the implications at the end. Um, we, we have had a lot of vandalism in the toilets. It takes up an awful lot of time at the moment. And I think you know, the, the design of this going forward and, and what they're able to do in terms of the improvements will be really, really important. And access is also really, really important. And as we negotiate with the town council, we will be looking to improve the accessibility. It would be great to have an outcome to improve the accessibility of at least some of the facilities um, going forward. So that will be part of the, of the negotiation. We're trying to make it as standardised and simple as pro um, a, a simpler process as possible. That's, that's the... And I know everyone's smiling, and I'm smiling too a little bit, but if, if we don't do that, we're, we're not going to get this done in a, in a timely way. I think, I think Burwash took about four years to get to a point of devolution. So we haven't got the time to do that. So we, we are well working with legal. Um, they have assured me that they can do this work in-house. But if at any point I think that we need to bring in some ex external funding, um, then we, we, we can look for the Investor Save Fund to actually enable this, this project to come forward. So I'm keeping a really close eye on that. In terms of the lease, that's, that's, that's our starting point, a, a long lease, probably a 99-year lease. Um, but, you know, it is about, it, it, it's a balance in terms of 
you know, our control over the future of, of um, use, um, but also trying to make this process as simple and, and standardised as, 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 as possible. Um, and, and, and just to be clear, when I say that, I, I mean, you know, I, I think we'd want some reassurance that some of these assets wouldn't be, um, you know, sold and then something else would happen on that site that wasn't agreeable to us. Of course, we do have, we still have planning, we still have all sorts of responsibilities to make sure that that doesn't happen. But, you know, that's, that's kind of the approach that we've taken elsewhere. It's the approach we've taken in Burwash. In fact, I think that is going to be, um, not, not Burwash, forgive me. Is it Burwash? Yes, it is Burwash. Um, that is going to be the model that quite a lot of work went in, into that lease. And I think that will be the model that we try and emulate in all the other leases that we work with, with local councils, town councils, um, going forward. Um, so it's, it's, it's not perfect. <laughs> but we're trying to find a pragmatic way through. Uh, thank you, Lorna. Uh, Christine, did you have your hand up? Yeah. Um, thank you, Chair. I, I mean, I've got a couple of sort of questions. I mean, the first thing I'd like to say is, is I, I think this is an you know, excellent sort of piece of work that's got off onto the right start. And uh, obviously we've looked at the history of... of how we've dealt with devolution in, in, the, in the past. We've looked at how we can improve that. And it's really great to see that you've built a really good relationship with the um, town clerk um, at Bexhill to sort of get this uh, moving forward. I, I've got, so my first question is, um, I know that Bexhill Town Council currently has one and a half, I think, uh, full-time members of staff. And do, do we feel they've got the capacity um, to take this on and to manage these with, with one and a half members of staff? And do we know um, whether, whether that's, um, that might be a, a risk to the, you know, a risk to the project? Um, number two, do we know, um, uh, speaking to um, some of the town councillors about the other seal money that they, they are due. As I understand it, there is, I think, something like 68,000 in the account which is due to, to go to them. But they are saying until they've got the money in the bank account, uh, they're not counting that, but they already have that money. And I think it's already allocated to them that their percentage of the of the seal receipts, um, so, uh, so I would ask about that. And then I just wanted to say something about um, those um, people or members of the town council that talk about double taxation. This is a means, or this will lead to double taxation. It, won't, it, double, it would have been double taxation if we were actually, people were paying council tax towards the costs of, of the toilets, but the reality is that we've we've had to borrow from um, from our um, from our um, reserves in order to fund this service. So it's n in that sense, it's not double taxation. Um, and now, if we move if we move the toilets to the town council, we can pr properly reflect, and they can, I believe. And this is one of the. the this was one of the things that I campaigned on since 2017. I think, actually, they can do a more cost-effective job because they're local um, and they can use... You know, they're not bound by the same bureaucracy that we are in terms of, of uh, allocating contracts for cleaning and, and what have you. So, two questions and a statement. Uh, Lorna, are you happy with those questions? Yeah. Um, Thanks, Councillor Bayliss. In terms of capacity, I, I think um, the Town Council will need to decide what staffing it needs going forward, um, you know, in, in, in terms of, of, of taking on this, this responsibility. Um, I, I thought the Town Council was considering a facilities officer. I'm not quite sure where they got with that. Um, but obviously that, that's down to them, how they organise themselves. Um, so we, we can't really interfere too much in that. With regard to the £68,000 of local SIL, that is still that's being, being collected since the Town Council came into existence. The £218,000 seal that we're talking about in this report 
was collected between 2016 and 2021 before the town council came into existence. So I understand that, that we um, had a chat to Jeff actually um, about making, he's not here now, I'm just looking for him, he's gone, but um, I did have a chat to Jeff about making sure that that, that £68,000 SIL payment gets passed over, it, it is theirs, it has been collected um, whilst they've been in existence. And again, what they choose to do with that is entirely up, up to them, they are their own entity. Um, the double taxation issue, I think this is um, something which many councils across the country have been grappling with, and it's the continuation of discretionary services. And we're, we're not the first, in fact, we're probably towards the end of the queue on doing this work. And where a town council or a parish council has been in existence, um, you know, there's been work over the last 10 years or so to devolve these, these services whole scale. So I think this is an opportunity to protect discretionary services, to improve them, to have more local involvement in, in, in the shaping of them in the future. And, you know, this is very much about the town council shaping the services that they want going forward based on community need. So Jonathan and then um, Kevin, and then I've got um, Sam, Christine and Paul. Right. Um, and I think to help that, that discussion uh, over the years, one thing that has been an issue with public toilets is the fact that uh, business rates are being charged. That has now changed, and so that will significantly reduce the cost of uh, the, the ongoing cost of running public conveniences for any town or parish council that picks them up. Uh, I wanted to bring something up which hasn't featured in this report, but it did feature in a discussion in the SIL group. Uh, and those minutes haven't been issued yet, so I can't really uh, go into that. Uh, but um, Ash might like to comment as well. This, these buildings, and I don't know each one individually, may have the opportunity for the uh, installation of solar panels. And uh, the, there's, there's already a program with, uh, town, uh, with the village halls to uh, basically put solar panels on as, as effectively a... A funded by funded through SIL, and that's a very that, that's been received very well. I think at last count there was 27 out of the 44 village halls had indicated they wanted to take that up. There's an enormous the, the, this is a double real double benefit. Uh, it meets our climate change objective of decarbonisation. We can have a direct impact on doing this, um, and uh, and it is easy to do as well. For the benefit of, the, the, this is for the greater wider social benefit, the benefit for the town council will be potentially a source of income which will offset the costs. And I think generally speaking, uh, and it really will depend on each building, if we, can, if we can include that, we could potentially fund it through the climate change SIL funding. And it's not a significant cost. So it is, uh, it's all well within reach. So it will, it will benefit uh, the community, the greater social benefit, decarbonisation, and bring some income towards the maintenance. And I don't, somehow that hasn't quite sort of, it, I think because this has all been moving on in parallel, perhaps something that hasn't been considered. But I would ask you to consider that. And I'm sure it would be well received as it follows the same process as the other project. Thank you. Well, I think that's, that's an interesting point. Um, Lorna, did you want to, you've made yeah. a note of that? Um, I, I, I certainly think we should be trying to seek the most positive outcomes from this project. And the reason it didn't go into the report was because obviously that, that's something we need to look at the feasibility of. We've got these condition surveys going on at the moment. But also, um, you know, there's, there's other things like accessibility. So if we can sort of build, um, through our negotiations with the town council, we can build some really positive outcomes beyond just providing toilets, I think we'd definitely be wanting to do that. Do you want to wrap up, move it, and then if I can invite Kevin and then the other councillors that are here. Kevin. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Tony Bowden uh, furnished me with a, number, a lot of figures on toilets, um, and so I can bore you for quite some time on, on exactly how much these things cost. I mean, um, Councillor Council Vinehall is right. We, we now save um, business rates, but that's only 10% of the total cost. We were spending £546,000, as in 2021. That now has been reduced by about £50,000. So it's half a million pounds that the, the council spends on toilets. And some of the numbers are, are, are quite 
uh, staggering. The Pole Grove Grandstand toilets, for example, cost over £18,000 a year. It's an awful lot of money. Um, and, and some of the actual, most of the actual cost is in contract cleaning, of which that is £225,000. So in devolving these, these toilets, not only can we save ourselves some money, but we can save ourselves a considerable amount of carbon footprint as well, because we still have someone going around opening all our toilets and then going around and closing all our toilets across the whole of Rother. And that is not the way forward in this day and age. We should be able to do these things remotely and without actually having people driving around and around. And, of course, these facilities are, in, in, in the main, in a pretty poor condition as well. So we're spending half a million pounds on, on facilities that are, are, are poor. So I completely welcome this, uh, this um, initiative with something that the, the Deputy Chief Executive has, has really got to grips with, and I thank her very much because this is a key plank to our financial um, stability programme. We must devolve these toilets, we must move on, and Bexhill Town Council are the people who will be far better at being able to do this and do this a lot more environmentally friendly and a lot cheaper, and it's to be welcomed, and I can't wait for the rest of the parishes to be come on board with this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um, Councillor Maidley, Chris, you, are you looking to redeclare this item now and then make your comment, please? I, yes, Chairman, thank you. I wish to reconfirm my personal interest in uh, Excel, Old Town Preservation Society as a director. And my question to uh, Lorna is um, how soon may we be able to receive perhaps a draft lease? on these premises, or a premise. Thank you. We, we have our first meeting of the devolution working group. Now we've got to this stage. We're sort of involving other off officers across the council. That's happening tomorrow. And that will be one of my questions to our legal team. Um, but they have assured me that um, they felt they needed a three-month window to do this, this work. Um, to, to get that in place and you know as I say um, the more standardized the approach that we can take the, the quicker that will be but it's it's on my radar to make sure that this is something that's that's you know we're not going to be held up on the legals is that you want to ask another question Chris? Um, yes it, it, it has three months um, and obviously I'm specifically thinking about uh, Manor Gardens cart um, toilets, but if um, the Old Town Preservation Society is to discuss this, there must be a, I mean, you're wanting answers from us, but if we can, it's going to take three months before we see a draft lease, it's going to be very difficult. The two don't add up. Thank you. Yeah, I, I, I think with, um, with um, Bexhill um, Old Town Preservation Society, I think it's about understanding your interest. It might be on a slightly different track to the town council which of course is um it will need to set a precept if it's going to take on um the, these additional services so they're absolutely fixed but we are hoping to have we have got the burwash lease to sort of use as a starting point um so it isn't that none of this work has been done i mean hopefully and, and when i say three three months you know that's that's hopefully to get to a point of of, of, of being able to agree that lease hopefully we'll be able to get a draft of it much much quicker than that um, but it may be that, you know, we can work on a slightly different timetable. We are really fixed with the town council because they have to set their, their precept. But it might be that we can work on a slightly different timetable because um, I, I know we haven't actually discussed this yet. This is to be agreed in August. So I appreciate your, your sort of um, working on a tight time, timeline then. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Lorna. Um, Sam, Paul, I think that's it. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to say I think this um, will be welcomed by quite a few of my residency in Sydney. There was a post recently on um, social media. Someone had taken their young child into Sydney toilets to find blood and excrement all over the walls. Quite a nasty depiction that they, they wrote. And underneath comes comment after comment after comment of people saying, oh, yeah, no, I've never, I've not, I don't go in those toilets anymore. Oh, they're awful toilets. They can't be cleaned properly. They need, re you know. So there, there are clearly issues with some of our public conveniences uh, that... We as a district council just don't have the capacity to keep fixing and keep sorting out long term. Uh, and I think the, this scheme, you know, with the Bexhill Town Council uh, taking them on, they're, they're much better suited to looking after them 
more cost-effectively, more environmentally friendly, more locally. Uh, they can tackle issues when the issues happen, uh, and they they can raise or lower their precept in order to to meet that. Um, and as for double taxation, which I know is a concern of several residents who've got in contact with me with a, about that, in terms of all of these sort of devolution things, it isn't double taxation because if we didn't shift this cost onto the town council now, we would have to find those savings elsewhere, and that might mean losing core services, or it might mean having to close down these public conveniences altogether. And that would be far worse, I think. This is about securing them and actually making them more efficient uh, and better for residents in the long term. So I think, I think this is a really positive move. And certainly I think Sidley will be very appreciative of nice toilets they can use in the future. Thank you. Yeah, yeah thank you for those points, um, <clears throat> Sam. I think they were very relative points. Uh, Councillor Cortell, Paul. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Public conveniences in Bexhill can be foul. They have been subject to vandalism. And I'm very pleased to see the improvement in the men's toilet in Devonshire Square. And uh, perhaps that's a prelude to what could be achieved with some of the other toilets um, in the coming couple of years. Um, I look forward to the creativity of the Town Council in focusing on public conveniences to an extent that we uh, cannot with all our conflicting interests. And um, uh, the case has been made by Councillor Dixon, Councillor Coleman, about uh, the cost-effectiveness of employing people locally and not having our procurement processes and uh, I love the um, concept that Councillor Van Hall's made about installing s solar panels. Um, I wrote to Councillor Proshak a few months ago about the possibility of imitating a toilet in New Zealand which um, decorated with recycled materials which became a tourist destination. And I think that um, if that is considered by the town council, it will improve the aura of the town centre of Bexhill and um, uh, help economic regeneration. Yeah. Uh, thank you for those comments, um, Paul. Um, I think we're at the point of moving this report, um, Sue, and um, tying up uh, any loose points. Thank you very much. I think, it's, I think that lots and lots of good points have been made. But actually, it's about getting our house in order at last. It really is, because this has been a policy for a long time, but it's been on the too difficult to do pile. Um, I still bear the scars for Robertsbridge being devolved many, many years ago. Um, and it does bring, bring up the point of double taxation, that's for sure. Um, but this is getting our house in order. And what we needed to do to get our house in order was to actually actually have a Bexhill Town Council and that was the first step we had to take to do this so the Bexhill Town Council was there um, then the Bexhill Town Council did the right thing and did a big survey they called it the big survey I think where they got huge response which basically residents in Bexhill said they wanted to keep the toilets and so that gave the mandate to the Bexhill Town Council which is why we've got the meeting tonight to say that, that in principle, that's what they're, they're going to do. And has, has been said by everybody, uh, is that if you make decisions at the most local level, they are likely to be the most cost-effective and successful decisions. So it's right that the town council actually decide whether they want them, don't want them, improve them or not improve them. And the other thing about putting our house in order is, has been mentioned, is that actually we're not very proud of our toilets. They've been lacking in investment. Um, and Councillor Cortell will remember visiting the Rye toilets um, and the comments he made there. So we're, we're not proud of these toilets that are actually visitors go to them and tourists go to them. They're needed. So this is not about getting rid of them. It's about providing a better service, something better, and indeed maybe creative. I don't know. But that's up to the town council. Um, as mentioned by, by, by Councillor Field, 
let's hope that the procurement of the survey is not holding us up, that legal service is not holding us up. And I think we can look to Malcolm to actually make sure this happens because the other thing that we've put in place is, is Lorna, the Deputy Chief Executive. Without, without her involvement, without her driving it, without her relationship with the new town council, I don't think we will have got this far. So thank you so much for getting us here. And I think we should be putting the flags out because it's actually going to be a better place. And you move the uh, report? Got to do that, yeah. Move the report. Not very happy to say. Dixon, uh, thank you. And if we can uh, vote, please, um, that's unanimous. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, that sort of brings the meeting to a conclusion at 8.11. Uh, thank you, Lorna, for the report. And um, we'll, uh, we'll make some progress, I'm sure. Okay, good night, everyone.